Open your Bibles, if you will, to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37, you might pull the outlines out that we've included. We're using the life of Joseph to learn how God guides his children through difficult days. You might call this a survival guide for tough times. In fact, we've crafted a pledge of faith that helps us do just that. If you'd like to say it out loud with me, the words will appear on the screen. I'd invite you to fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope as we make this statement together. By God's power, I'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. I won't be foolish or naive, but nor will I despair. With God's help, I know I will get through this. Two quick reminders before we begin. I hope you'll go to the church website, oakhillschurch.com, and there look at the testimonies that have been posted about times in which God has led people through things. Might, you might consider posting your own. I know you'll find that to be an encouragement visit, encouraging visit. Also, if you're watching online, welcome. You can click on the version icon for outline and scriptures. Let's pray together. I do not take lightly this privilege, dear Father, that you would grant me moments in which to feed your flock. But Father, if anything good is said, it must be spoken by you. For I am a sinner in need of your grace. We pray that we could see Jesus through the life of Joseph and just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said, beginning in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 37, Joseph said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of the dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Joseph probably should have just kept these dreams to himself. <laughs> Here he walks into breakfast one morning bubbling and babbling about these images he had as he slept. First... He dreamed that his brothers were bowing down to him and he was in charge of them. And then he dreamed that his mom and dad were included in this and they were bowing down to him. Everybody would bow down to him in his dreams. He's only 17 years old. I don't know. Do you think he expected his brothers to get excited about this? <laughs> oh yeah, baby brother. Oh, we cannot wait until the day that we bow down before you. If so, that did not happen. In fact, just the opposite. One day when the brothers were away from the family tending sheep, they seized the opportunity to seize their younger brother Joseph and they threw him over the edge of a pit into a, a dry cistern. They stripped him of the fancy coat and they left him there. From deep in the pit, Joseph could hear them discussing what they would do with him. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. I think this is curious. Their collective consciences resisted sibling murder, but permitted sibling slave trade. And Joseph detected the sounds of a, a, a coming wagon and a donkey, and then some foreign accents and some new voices. And he realized there was a conversation taking place between his brothers and a, and a group of people. He overheard phrases like, we'll sell him to you. A couple of camels, perhaps? What do we do with him? Next thing he knew, one of his brothers was lowered down into the pit on a rope. And then the brother grabbed Joseph and the both of them were pulled out. 
And these traitors, these Ishmaelite traitors, began to poke and probe Joseph like he was a cow on the auction block. They stuck fingers in his mouth. They counted his teeth. They pinched his arms to see if he had any muscle. And Joseph realized what was happening, and he cried out, You cannot sell me. I'm your brother. But the brothers just shoved him to the side, and the negotiations began. We'll give you ten shekels of silver. No, no, no. We won't take less than 30. How about 15? No, 25. All right, 20. And finally they settled on a price. And Joseph was sold for the price of a handicapped slave. He must have cried out again. But the brothers didn't listen. They just grabbed the fancy coat and took the money and they walked away. And the merchants tied one end of the rope around Joseph's neck and the other end around the wagon. And Joseph, dirty and tear-stained, far from home, had no choice but to follow. He fell in behind the wagon and between the camels, and he looked over his shoulder, and there he saw the backs of his brothers as they disappeared over the horizon. He didn't know if he'd ever see them again. The summary passage of the chapter is, his brothers sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph with them down to Egypt. What sadder words could have been written. In fact, you might want to put one on your outline. Down to Egypt. Down is the operative word of this first installment of Joseph's life, and down is the direction his life took. The story opens with everything looking up, Joseph has a position place, position, uh, a place of preference in the family. He has the nicest wardrobe in the family. He's got a place of security in the family. Things are looking up, in fact, so much so he dreams that everybody's going to someday look up to him. Life is looking up, but what goes up must come. And it came down with a crash. The brothers put him down. Then they threw him down. And then they sold him down the river. And now he was led down the road to Egypt. With a turn of the page, we'll read, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Down, down, down. Down to Egypt. How quick this descent, stripped of his name, stripped of his position, everything he had, everything he thought he would ever have, gone. Poof. Just like that. Just like you. Am I talking to anyone who's being taken down to Egypt? Life has a way of taking us down. Down to the unemployment office, down to the divorce court, down to the custody hearing, down to the bottom of the pecking order, down to the soup line, down on your luck, down in the mouth, down, down, down to Egypt. If life is taking you down, you can find a kindred soul in the story of Joseph. By the time he arrived in Egypt, he had nothing. He had not a penny to his name or a name that was worth a penny. Not in Egypt. didn't matter if he was the great-grandson of Abraham. He couldn't tell people his name would someday be in the Bible. They didn't care. His position, his rank, his authority. They didn't even like his vocation. Egyptians, those clean-shaven people of the pyramid, didn't like these woolly, bearded people of the pasture. He had no money, no credentials to stand on, no vocation to call on, no family to lean on. He lost everything with one exception. Joseph still had God's dream. The story of Joseph begins with this dream. What a curious dream he has. And all we know is that this dream is all Joseph had when he went into Egypt. The Bible, did you note, says nothing about Joseph's training, 
his education, his superior skills, his talents. I'm sure he had some, but none of these are mentioned. What is mentioned, however, are these dreams. The narrator, the scripture, wants us to draw a conclusion. And that is, Joseph went down to Egypt with nothing but God's call on his heart. Heaven had tapped him on the shoulder and said, you will have a place of prominence in the plan of God. And by the time Joseph arrived in Egypt, that's all he had left. This dream, this, this call of God on his heart. And don't you know he clutched it like a life jacket in a tsunami. As he was trudging through the desert, he was thinking, all right. It's not going to end this way. God told me he had a call for me. While wearing the chains of the slave owners, he remembered, it won't end this way. I've been called to more than this. Beneath the heat of the desert sun, he told himself, he had to tell himself, God has greater plans for me. He had lost his home country. He had lost his dignity. He had lost his family. But he never... He never lost his belief in God's call on his life. Do you believe in God's call on yours? Were we somehow able to dig through all the clutter and busyness of life down into the very basement of your soul? Would we find a deep conviction that says that God has placed a call on me? You see, our God comes a calling. He called Joseph through a dream. He called Abraham through a voice. He called Moses through a bush. He called Gideon through an angel. He called David through a prophet. He called Daniel through a a vision. He called Joseph and Mary through an angel and Paul through Damascus Road experience. His means vary, but his plan is consistent. To every person, he issues this call, this dream. Maybe you've forgotten yours. The road down to Egypt can be tough on our calls. The path of the road is littered with forgotten dreams and abandoned hopes. Or maybe you never knew you had a call. If so, oh, what a privilege is mine to invite you to believe what God believes about you. Here it is. You are God's child. You are God's child. Before, folks, before you are anything else, you are a child of God. Before you're a banker, before you're a lawyer, before you're a cabinet maker, before you're a nurse, before you're a teacher, before you're old, before you're young, before you're black, before you're white, before you're Hispanic, before you are anything else, before you are male or female, strong or weak, handsome or not handsome, before you are anything else, listen, you are God's child. You are. You are. His creation, yes. His idea? Absolutely. But even more, you're his child. Do you understand that he who is all invites you to call him Father? You are his child. And he has declared he wants you in his family. He has declared your worth. He has walked onto the auction block of society and he has ramped his arm around you and he has said, this is my child. And he has bought you with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You are his child. And your life is more than this life. 
Do not believe the tombstone. It lies to you. It says that every human being has a date of birth and a date of death and a dash in between. You are more than this life. Your life did not begin with your birth. But you began, even before you began to breathe. Long before He laid down the earth's foundations, He had us in mind. And had settled on us as the focus of His love. You are so much more than this speeding train of days and decades before you were born to your parents you were born in the mind of God and did you know that you're going to outlive your death you're gonna outlive your death you're gonna come out on the other side of your own funeral When this tent we live in, our body here on earth is torn down, God will have a house in heaven for us to live in, a home He Himself has made, which will last, how long? Forever. Every voice in our society sucks us into this short-term thinking. You better do it all while you have a chance. We talk about dying. We talk about being buried. We have all of this language which would suggest to us that it's going to all come to an end, which according to Scripture is an absolute lie. He says this life is but a vapor. It's just just a wink. It's just the first word of the great story that God is writing with your life. This is the kind of call that God has on you. You're going to have struggles, but they're not going to last forever. You got a boss who degrades you. You got a family member who who berates you. Listen, just don't listen to them. Who died and made them king? Who says they have a call on you? God owns you. And He and He alone declares who you are. We live for the approval of others. We dance for the approval of others. We bend over backwards just to get somebody, to hear somebody say, I like you, I approve you, I want you. We sell ourselves down the road to Egypt because we fail to realize that God's portion is enough, that His approval is really all we need. This is the call He has on you. Maybe you feel like you've missed your chance and missed your prime. No. God specializes in lives like yours. And friends, every page of Scripture not just invites you, but dares you to believe in the God who believes in you. You're going to get through this. It won't be quick won't be painless but God can take every mess and use it for something good why because he has a call on you and you are God's child and your life is more than this life We tend to forget this. It gets lost on the road down to Egypt. Turbulent times call us to either question our destiny or certainly forget our identity. We redefine ourselves according to our scars. I'm the cancer patient. I'm I'm the divorcee. I'm the bankrupt businessman. You're a child of God. 
This is the call God has on you. And when we forget this, folks, we begin settling for a small call. We try to pack that tiny dash between the dates with as much life as we can because we don't think we're going to outlive this life. And we think our call is just to make money, to make friends, to make a name for ourselves, to make love with anybody who'll let us. We settle for a small call in life when God has called you into an eternal existence with Him, to reign with Him forever in a new kingdom. This is the dream He has planted in your heart. And that resonating voice within you right now is the Spirit of God, the witness of God's Spirit saying yes. You and I both know you were made for more than a small call. And our job when times get tough on the road down to Egypt, our job is to attune our ear to the high call of God and to turn a deaf ear to the small calls of life. Have you ever known anyone who did this? I have. Forgive me for using my father yet again as an illustration of faith. But the truth is, I just have never known anybody who lived the way he lived and most of all who died the way he died. He was 69 years old when he was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Crippling, cruel condition, especially for a robust mechanic who one day realized he couldn't turn a screwdriver. He had just retired. He had just retired. And he and mom had just bought this travel trailer. And they had this idea of pulling this travel trailer all over the country. visiting every state in the Union. Have you ever seen those little maps you can buy and put on the back of a trailer or a truck and then place an emblem of every state once you visited it? His goal was to fill that thing up. He'd worked for three decades as a mechanic and saved up enough money to retire and now they were going to travel the country. His road down to Egypt was not because his brothers betrayed him, but really because his body betrayed him, his, his health betrayed him. And just like that, and just in a matter of moments it seemed, he went from healthy and robust to unable to comb his hair or brush his teeth. Somebody had to carry him into bed and bathe him. He lost so much. My wife, Dinalyn, and I were newlyweds. We were living in Florida at the time, and we were preparing to move to Brazil where we were going to do mission work in Rio de Janeiro. But I wrote my dad a letter. I, I said, Dad, I can't go now. Not with this. My dad never wrote letters. He wrote me a four-page four reply that I kept in my Bible for many years until it got so creased and faded that I was afraid I was going to... You know, tear it up, and now I keep it in a safe place. But just a phrase from what he said. He said, in regards to my disease and you're going to Rio, that is really an easy answer for me, and that is go. Capital G, capital O, exclamation point. I must say that I have no fear of death or eternity. So don't be concerned about me. Just go, capital G, capital O, and please Him. 
Who can write words like that? Staring death in the face, having lost what you thought was going to be your golden chapter. Who can write words of faith and selfishness like that? I tell you who can. Someone who believes what God believes about them. Someone who believes that they are really God's child and that can never be taken. Someone who believes that they will truly outlive this life and that cannot be changed. Could I encourage you? you to believe what God believes about you. Do you know the Bible says that God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty, never canceled, never rescinded. I'm speaking to somebody who is being reminded today of a time in your life that you accepted God's call, but it's gotten lost in the busyness of life or the pain of life or that downward descent into Egypt. Could I invite you to reach back toward the hand of God and you know what? You will find the hand of God reaching for you as you take that call again. I'm speaking to someone who never knew this call. And this is God's hand reaching to you saying don't you listen to the television shows, don't listen to the magazines, don't listen to what society says. You are not the sum of what you have, not the sum of who you own, not the sum of how you look. You are a child of God. And you were made for holy purposes. And you'll get through this because you are His. And it's His dream that never dies. Will you receive God's call again on your heart? Can we affirm it one more time? We're going to post that declaration of faith on the screen. And I'd like to invite you now, having been reminded of the call God placed on Joseph's heart, to affirm the call that God has placed on yours. By God's power, I'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. I won't be foolish or naive. But nor will I despair. With God's help, I know I will get through this. Hear us, O Lord, as we make this declaration. It's our cry out to you to ask you, Father, to grant us strength. Father, for those whose lives are healthy and robust and happy, we give you thanks. But we know that even in those seasons, our life can turn down in a moment's notice. And for those who are today finding themselves on the road down to Egypt, would you remind them what you did for Joseph and tell them, Father, that you can do it still. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said.